Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for today's strategic planning series, Creating Strategy Part 2. My name is Lauren Hogan. I'm a regional marketing coordinator here at JMT. And joining us today is Ed Kless, Senior Director, Partner Development and Strategy from SAGE, and Rob Johnson, Chief Revenue Officer of JMT. Just a couple of housekeeping notes before I turn it over to Ed and Rob. If you have any questions during the webinar today, please go ahead and submit them into the Q&A section as you think of them. We'll save them all until the end of the presentation, but don't hesitate to submit them as they come. Also, just a reminder that we'll send both some handouts and the recording of today's webinar within 24 hours after it has concluded. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Ed and Rob, to get us started. All right, well, thanks so much. So I'm just scrolling through the list of attendees. I don't know if I told you this, Rob, but the, the last time we, when we did a part one of our conversation about strategy, there was a name on the, on the list and the name was, was Joseph Galante. And I kind of flipped through the list. I was like, oh, I know a Joseph Galante. It turns out it was the same Joseph Galante that I knew. Uh, he works uh, for New York State and um, is. Uh, we went to high school together. Not only did we go to high school together, we were both in Glee Club, and he and I did a lot of. Uh, and you're 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 aware of this, Rob? My pension for for singing Billy Joel songs. Yes, um, I am. <laughs> Joe Joe is a fantastic, in, incredibly talented pianist, and mm. uh, so he and I and another friend of ours, who's now a dentist, did a a skit together in our at our high school junior ring night so it was anyway it was great to connect oh, with him even though that? i didn't know it was him yeah he sent he sent me an email afterwards so i don't see him on today but uh, if he does join us I'll, I'll try to give him another shout out but uh a small world but i wouldn't want to paint it as stephen wright would say exactly <laughs> so our, our conversation today rob is going to focus around strategy we we talked a lot about this last time as well but we're going to take a slightly different tact to it today those of you who have participated in both previous uh, webcasts can kind of just tune out for the next few minutes. I'm just going to give a, a quick recap to get everybody caught up for those that didn't participate. But our first session was about building strategic, not strategic, shared vision in an organization. And we talked about how that is the, is the predecessor for strategy. You really have to make sure that your shared vision is in place, uh, is well distributed through the organization before you can start to build on it through strategy. And then last time when we talked about strategy, we talked about really a set of strategic questions. And I gave a box where we wanted to fill in these questions around the who, what, when, where, the who, what, and how of what we're going to do from a strategic thinking, a strategic planning perspective. Today, we're going to focus more on tools, on strategic planning tools and how one would implement them. But just to, by way of quick review on some of these topics, the first thing I want to remind and share with you, and this, this I didn't talk about last time, but I did talk about this in the, the first, very first webcast with regard to shared vision. And that is this notion of putting what matters before how. And I think there's a danger in, that I want to re reflect in this part of the conversation. And that is very often, mm -hmm. as we're beginning the process of strategic planning, someone in the, in, in the, at, toward the beginning of the conversation will start to ask extraordinarily practical questions. And these are the questions that are lifted on the left-hand side of the slide here. How, do you, how are we going to do this? How long is it going to take? How much is it going to cost? How are we going to get the people to change? How are we going to measure it? And how have other people done this successfully? These are good questions. I don't have anything against these questions per se, but what they tend to do, especially when we're talking about strategy, is they tend to, when asked and answered too early in the process, they tend to stifle innovation and change because these, these questions, while important, uh, are, are, are natural defense mechanisms against change. So when we don't want to do something, what we do is we pepper the person who's proposing the new thing with very practical questions and when they don't have answers, we say, well, see, we can't do it. And it's not helpful because it, oftentimes we're going to get stuck. So what I want to strongly encourage is try to stay on the right side of this. Start to have conversations about what refusals are we postponing? What commitments are you willing to make? Value, contribution, judgments, 
And of course, lastly, what do we want to create together? Rob, any uh, further insight? Well, I know you've seen this as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the left side just uh, takes out the opportunity for innovation. Um, if we if we focus and and it's uh, which which is the real beauty of having strategic thinking and planning is that it creates the opportunity to innovate, to do things differently, to to create new solutions, new services, new things that don't exist. And that only happens on the right side of this beautiful green bar report that you've got here, uh, <laughs> not on the left. So I think that's the that's the struggle of going to uh, the how too early, is it removes the you know the potential for creating something that you hadn't hadn't yet imagined. Absolutely correct. I mean, that, that really, if you look at that, especially that last question that how have others done it successfully, yeah. it presupposes that someone has done it successfully. Yeah. And therefore, if it hasn't been done successfully, you can't do it. Well, as you said, it kills innovation. There is, it, it, there is no possible innovation happening if you ask that question too early in the process. And that implies that, that they're identical. The, the, the environments are identical, right? If, if we look at, if we're going to take what someone else has done successfully and try to copy that. It assumes so many things that we are exactly identical to that other thing, which is never the case, right? We all have our own individual strengths and conditions and circumstances and environmental things and whatever. So that's the, it's, and for those of us who are more, you know, driven, highly driven to solve problems to get things done, we want to get to how immediately. And so right. this, this, you know, this discipline of not getting to how, of staying in the what, it creates this opportunity for us to imagine things, to invent things, to innovate things um, that we would lose if we went to how first. Yeah, what, one of the reasons, by the way, and we talked a little bit about this last time for involving someone uh, either outside the organization or who is inside the organization, but at least can, can, can facilitate a meeting with disinterest, not uninterested yeah. but disinterested right <laughs> and there's a difference between that those sounds terrible well. man, but it's, yeah i get it <laughs> well there's a difference between uninterested and disinterested right so yeah. um so that's what we want to do the, the next th a quick reminder too in and i love this as a diagnostic tool for where you may have fallen down in the past and what you're looking for here is, so what, what are the things that you see as the impediments to what you've done? Are, do you see confusion, anxiety, slow rate of change, frustration, false starts? That kind of, if you read this down the left-hand side, then go out to the right, that, that will let you know where you should focus your attention. Now, and I made the joke last time, well, what if it's all of them? I said, well, then, you know, just start at the very beginning and let's move forward. Um, and I don't know, probably an anti-anxiety medication is in order somewhere for some of us, including myself in some cases. Um, so I just like this as a, as a very brief opening diagnostic tool um, for, from uh, the, bat, the ground up. A uh, quick reminder, what we're focused on here is is a the model called the 7s model which was developed by McKinsey and company uh, this is the modified version of the model shared vision again as I mentioned is has to come first then we move on to strategy and then the other stuff that we talk about perhaps in some future webcasts will be on the other s's we're still talking about this middle bubble of strategy as our focus for the conversation today uh, and uh, last uh, two reminders one, this is what the normal beliefs are about strategy is that it's about analyzing your situation. It's about planning and it's about what to do. And, I, and we talked extensively last time about how we really think that the realities are is that strategy is more creative than analytical. Strategy is being able to execute. And lastly, strategy is like a diet. It's what are you going to say no to, right? What, 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 what can you say no to in an organization instead of, hey, shiny new thing? Rob, some insights on that, because I know you've seen a lot of organizations who struggled, especially with that last bullet point. It's, it's like squirrel, most, right? <laughs> it is the most difficult thing. The shiny object comes in many forms, many, you know, many different looks and feels. And it's, um, it takes an extraordinary amount of discipline uh, to say no to things because there are opportunities to serve, there are opportunities to make, there, you know, but having a really strong roadmap makes it easier uh, to say no to things. Um, and I think we say yes to things in the absence of a, a well thought strategy. So when we're, you know, when we don't have 
uh, an opportunity to go through this this process of planning and, and of uh, evolving and creating, it makes us more susceptible to the constant yes. And that hurts and sometimes kills organizations. Um, so that's the, that's what I've seen lots. Yeah, no, so very, very true, Robin. And you know, the, one, the, the big challenges, especially and I hear this a lot from, from colleagues or team members in the organization who say, well, you know, we're, we're able to focus, but our, our leadership is the one that has trouble with the shiny new object and they constantly are pivoting us in new directions. And it, that is absolutely a, a challenge. I think the, 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 you know, the way, the way to handle that is to try to remind the leader that, hey, you know, we, we put this plan in place for a reason and made a commitment to this in, in it for at least a you know four or six month period. Let's see how this plays out before we start to introduce new stuff. Um, you know, we we want to remain flexible. I think yeah, that the, the Darwin never said uh, survival of the fittest. He, he actually the theory is more survival of the most adaptable. So we want to remain adaptable from a strategic standpoint. But mm -hmm. once we start to commit to a strategy. There's a lot of, especially the stuff about what you're going to say no to, saying yes to that really countermands everything that has come before it and usually leads to, um, unfortunately, bad morale inside the organization. 2020 taught us one thing about adaptability. Um, and that is, <laughs> and so it's a good example of, you know, not necessarily, you know, adaptability isn't necessarily a, you know, a chosen pursuit of being adaptable. It's what's chosen for us. And uh, COVID has taught us one thing is that there, you know, we, we do in fact have to embrace adaptability. Yep. The, the last thing I want to remind everyone before we start to get into the tools, and I've got four or five tools that I want to show you for creating these strategic conversations, um, and, that is, and that is this. Uh, I believe that the beginning question that we need to start around strategy is not how much revenue are we going to raise, what, not, what, what, is our, what is our future fundraising effort going to be, but instead, it has to be how, how much value are, are we going to create for our constituencies in our given strategic period, and how are we going to do that? Uh, too many organizations, both for-profit organizations and not-for-profit organizations, think that strategy is about the raising of revenue firstly. It, I'm not saying it doesn't have to do with it at all. I would be an idiot if I said that. But to think that the first thing that we need to do is figure out what our revenue, what, what, our, what our, our fundraising is going to be as a, as a strategic purpose, that's not going to be helpful. We really have to ha begin with what we're going to do long term for our constituencies. And the longer you can maintain focus on this question before you start the conversation about raising funds, which I absolutely agree you have to do, but the longer you can delay having that conversation, I believe the stronger your strategic plan and strategic vision will be. So further thoughts on that, Rob? I think, well, first of all, for those of you who weren't around last time or didn't write it down, Ed's, you know, hard to understand acronym in the top left of this. <laughs> all right. <laughs> which is the mother of all strategic questions, by the way, which, so you can forget that now, but um, uh, that's Ed's question there. Um, you know, I think I on the on the fundraising or the revenue side, it's mu it's much easier to go and execute on that aspect once we have a really strong strategy uh, that we've then taken to you know the things we're going to talk about today. Um, so it's, it is it, it I think revenue rec or you know funds development revenue uh, fundraising whatever comes subsequent to this. And it's, it makes it much easier to tell a great story if you have a really well-crafted, well-thought-through strategy. Absolutely, yeah, good stuff. All right, let's talk about the, the first of the, the, the tools. And this is, I, I refer to this as the, the oldest and most basic strategic planning tool, the SWOT analysis, strengths, yeah. weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Um, I'm not sure if you're th this little painting over here on the left hand uh, side of the slide that's the the caves in uh, I think in uh, Vers Versailles, uh, France, where the, the earliest known human paintings and I'm pretty sure that that was a SWOT analysis Rob. Right. They're like, you know, we, they, they've got the big horns and are much bigger than us. Um, we've got the bow and arrows. So that's like, a, you know, and that's our opportunity threat. So I'm pretty sure the first thing that they were painting about was a SWOT analysis. I'm pretty sure that's not correct, Ed. But, uh, 
but uh, in fact, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that is definitely not it. But I do think it's an interesting way to look at it. <laughs> and so uh, because it is a, a pretty old and it still can be a very useful tool. But one of the things that I believe has happened over time is that we've missed or we, we've forgotten that there is an alignment of the SWOT. It, it was, it, and I think this is because we did it in PowerPoint <laughs> and yeah. Word documents. And what we need to remember is that there's balance to this, right? So, so strengths are counterbalanced against weaknesses. That's pretty, pretty obvious, but we should think that sometimes our strengths are also lead to what our weaknesses are. So we should be looking for those as we begin to develop these. And then we have the, our opportunity and then threats, which also counterbalance one another. But they also line up ver um, vertically with each other as well. In other words, what we're looking to do is when we do have our list of strengths, we want to align those with the opportunities and mm -hmm. try to figure out, okay, the opportunities we have, how do they most align with our strengths? Or are there strengths that we have that we can take advantage of that are in that that will help us with those opportunities? And same things with weaknesses. If we identify what something is a weakness, is are we also is there also also a threat in that area? And is there something that we should do to counterbalance that? So this notion of not only the the horizontal but the vertical lining up of the SWAT is, I think, critically important. Now for, for the most part, SWOT analysis are intended to be developed from the bottom up in the organization. However, unfortunately, and this, and this is unfortunately in my view, I tend to see them more developed from a top down standpoint. In other words, leadership gets together and does the organizational SWOT analysis and then pushes this down into the organization and says, okay, now that we have, now that we on high have developed this SWOT analysis, you down below will go and make this happen. And I think that's a mistake. Uh, Peter Drucker, when he used this tool as well, would do this from the bottom up. In other words, people start at departments or even individual levels from a SWOT analysis, and they do it individually for their and their teams, and then the teams roll up inside the organization. Now, of course, if you, this is strategy for a small organization, if you're two, three, or four people. Well, this is pretty inherent that you're going to be doing this together. So, but if you are any larger than that, you know, a dozen people or more, think about implementing when you do do your SWOT analysis, start from the ground up if you can. Rob, thoughts on the SWOT analysis? Yeah, to uh, to your point that it's a it's it's a you know it's it's not a top down. It it has to be a bottom up. Um, having grown up and been in the in the software sales end of the industry for a long time, territory there's so much variation in 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 you know territories in terms of geographics or demographics, uh, psychographics, competitors it, it, that SWOT analysis is very helpful at the front end of doing any kind of planning because it, it helps you you know in a disinterested way in a dis you know look at the environment and make kind of a, an analytical understanding of what's happening in the environment that you're in. Um, so it's not a monolith, right? We don't, you don't, we don't operate at the high end level. And that's what he was talking about is, you know, organizations function at the, you know, at a local level. And the SWAT is often very different depending on the circumstances in a, in a territory. So if you're a national organization, you got 50 offices or 20 offices or 10 offices, the SWAT is different by the office. If you're an automaker today and you're not significantly looking at the SWOT analysis of do we stay with you know with uh, car you know internal combustion engines or do we go with batteries you've missed you've missed it the, there's probably a pretty big argument that you should be having that uh, go on so anyway yeah yeah, yeah. and just just uh, uh, in in terms of the the, the SWOT again I, I I really think that the key here regardless is the, the the alignment and it is so often forgotten about that you want to make sure that there's both the vertical and the mm -hmm. horizontal alignment uh, mm -hmm. for those things and this is where you begin to fill in holes so if there's huge if there's huge amount of strengths in one particular area and you don't have opportunities in that area well, you should be figuring out what are some opportunities in Look, that area. I think, I think they're related. I think every time you, and this uh, this may or may not be completely true all the time, but it's been true most of the time for me, 
if, the, if, if there is a threat that I'm dealing with, there's almost always a corresponding opportunity that is the, you know, that is embedded inside that threat. It may require dramatic change or realignment or whatever, but that's, it's just the way it's worked generally. Whenever there is an existential threat, there is almost always some form of, you know, significant opportunity on the other side of that. So they're not, threats are very important to understand. Um, you know, your strengths, weaknesses are also very, but, but the bottom half of that grid, uh, there's always a corresponding opportunity. Um, so it's, it's helpful to know what the threats are because in many cases, they help us reveal what the opportunities can be. Absolutely. Yep. So that's the first tool that you certainly can use and uh, you know, pretty straightforward. It's just a, a matter of sitting around a table talking about those different things and get getting them up on board being via some brainstorming. But the next tool that I want to share with you is another simple tool, but I think a little bit better from my standpoint, if only because the only real way to implement this is bottom up. You, you can almost not, you can't do this one top down. It tends to make absolutely no sense. So, and that is start, stop, continue. And the idea behind this would be is that each individual person in the entirety of the organization answers three questions. What would they personally in the next period of time will define that strategy, whether it's 12 months, two years, three years, what would they like to start doing over that time period? What did they feel personally they would like to stop doing inside the organization? And what would they like to continue doing? What part, what aspects of their, their job, job description or role do they enjoy doing and would want, want to continue? And what I have found when implementing this in especially smaller organizations is that when you get the, the folks to sit down and do this on an individual basis, each person to do a start, a stop, and a continue. Well, the first thing that we always notice is that no, nobody has enough stops. <laughs> the, the, there's lots of stuff that they want to start, but not so much that they want, want to stop doing. Um, and that's a problem. So it, it kind of says, hey, we think we have a resource issue here, if that's, if that's uh, potentially the case. But it's also a good reminder to say, hey, if you want to start doing something, you're probably going to have to let go of something. What I've found happen, and almost, I, I, I can't think of a time when this didn't happen when I implemented this in an organization. So after individuals did it and they rolled it up to the next level, say it would be a team of, say, five or six people invariably there would be something that somebody wanted to start doing that somebody else wanted to stop doing. And it was wonderful because you're like, okay, you stop doing it, you start doing it. And uh, th this led to some really good conversations because in a lot of cases, what started happening is the appropriate resource, the person who had the strength in that particular area ended up getting the work that was more appropriate to them. And as a result, they did it more effectively um, and therefore made the entirety of the organization better. So it's just, it was just amazing how often these, these start stop continues on an individual basis ended up canceling each other out. But here's the thing. So when you get together in that team setting and you go through your individual start stop continues, you lining them up, put them on a big wanking spreadsheet in the office or whiteboard, however you want to handle it. And you just, everybody's is across the board. Best times to, you can do it. Uh, what is it? Can, can bond style, Rob, with the sticky notes, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> can bond for the rest of the world. Can ban for Ed. I heard can ban. Yeah, really? That, I seriously perfect. heard yeah. that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Anyway, <laughs> I'm not, it's Japanese word. I don't honestly is, do yes, not know. I have is. no idea. Um, <laughs> must be that New Yorker in me. Uh, the, the, the idea here would be is that once you've got this all laid out, is after you, div you go through the individual ones, the team then says, okay, great. Now let's work together on our group start, stop, continue, which is distinguish separate from the start yeah. stop continue of the individuals it's for the team together now you can use the start stop continues of individuals as inputs into it but what i really like is the thought process behind it gets people flowing around this idea of start stop continue and once they do it on an individual basis it makes it much much easier to then begin to do it on a team basis that's why i said there's no 
I think, really practical way to implement Starscop Continue top down and push it down. It only really works bottom up, which is why I think it's a more effective tool than the SWOT analysis, because there's less there's less of a danger of the, the top down manifesto conversation. Whatever work process or program or action or whatever is going on that would be a subject to this kind of analytics has to have, you have to have a really good understanding of what your end in mind was, uh, of what it is that, you know, whatever it is that we're doing. I, we work a lot with marketing and in marketing, you get constant feedback as to, you know, the effectiveness of whatever it is that we're doing. So we're constantly getting to evaluate, start, stop, continue. And there should be like another button, which is continue, but a ton more, you know, a lot, do a lot more of. Um, but so start, stop, continue requires that we have a, have a good idea of what it was we were aiming for so that we're having something that we can measure this against, right? Some... Uh, even you know, even if it's somewhat arbitrary, we're we're going to aim for this. A lot of times when we're doing projects or programs, we don't exactly know what the you know what the current top level of performance is. So we're going to set one just to give us a thing to measure against. You know, even if it's somewhat transitional, this is super helpful. But only if we have a way of actually evaluating. You know, did is this? Are we getting what we want out of this? Um, and on the, the last thing I would say is on, on this kind of thing, we have an, a, an approach and the teams that I get the chance to work with here is really around winning or learning. Um, and we look at something and we say, you know, is this, is this being successful? And if it's not being as successful, what are we learning from that? And out of that comes our start, stop, continue, right? If we, if we just constantly are not seeing what we think we should, then we're evaluating it. Do we need to fix something, do something radically different, or should we just stop that entirely and move on to something else? Well, th yeah, thanks for the insight, Rob, because you, you, giving that practical experience is very helpful, I think. Just want to remind folks that if you do have some questions, uh, please go to the question panel, type them in. They'll be filtered on over to us. Um, Lauren, I do have mine open, so if you do pa have any to pass over to me, that's great, and you can pass them over mid-conversation or we're certainly willing to take questions at the end as well. Uh, we also, uh, and I'm, I know uh, Lauren's gonna give a reminder of this, have office hours coming up. Uh, I think it's next week, might be two weeks, but, but Lauren will have the, the dates for us on that, where uh, I, I will be on to answer any questions that, are, that come up during these. Because what we've really found is that, hey, us lecturing you is great for an hour, but the questions that you have once you start to implement this in your organization, they need to get answers as well. So we wanna provide an opportunity for that. Um, this next one is not quite as old as the SWOT analysis, which you know goes back to France. Uh, th this one goes back to the company called Xerox uh, in, in the 1960s. And they were the, the, the first one to establish this syllogism, which Did you move is- your, You didn't move your screen, Ed. I didn't? No, well, it's still on start, stop, continue. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the share and restart it because that's what attempt tends to happen occasionally. Now let's redo this. Good thing I'm here. Yeah. Keep me from trouble. How about, how's that, Rob? That I can't see anything because you haven't shared it. can't see anything? Screen. Okay, how's that? Slightly better. I now see your name, Ed. Wait, I feel like this is an epic fail right now, bro. No, I see a black screen. Hmm. I know, that's terrible. All right, so let me try a different share. Okay. I'm going to share a desktop instead of an application, so sometimes that works a little bit better. Yeah. No. Still no bueno? No. Do you want me to try? Sure, Rob. This would be, uh, I'll stop sharing. Yep. Yeah, hang on. Let me try That's why we have backup. Yeah, that's right. See. You see that? Yeah. Yes. That looks good. But, okay, I'm gonna put it in that. Is that the one, Ed? Yep, that's it. Fabulous. Perfect, Rob. Thanks. Amazing. Yep. Smooth transition too. So uh, again, this is a the, what's, what's known as the Xerox syllogism, developed in the 1960s, and they they established this uh, fascinating mathematically as as not just. Um, 
correlations, but actual causality. And here's, here's what they said is that it's colleague satisfaction. We would known it as team member or internal, uh, the, the folks that work in the organization. Colleague satisfaction is what drives customer satisfaction, or if you can say constituent satisfaction for not for profits, however you, whatever, whatever phrase you use for that. But if we, if we want our customers to be happier, we don't say, let's make our customers happier. We actually look back one and say, what do we do to make our team members happy? And the team members are the ones that then make the customers happy or the constituents happy. And it's, it's ha having these constituents that are happy or well-served uh, and that, that drives then financial performance. And the same thing is true here. If you're looking at driving additional financial performance, whether it's increased donations, the, the, which you know the the holy grail of not most not-for-profit organizations, you don't say let's let's increase donations. What you say is how can we keep our ha team happy, or how can we keep our our constituencies happier so that they are more likely to donate money to us. So it's the it's very interesting thing to to look at financial. If you're looking at uh, financial performance as your predictor of future financial performance, it's never going to work. You can't, you can't predict what's going to happen financially by looking at prior financial statements. Um, and we, I talked a lot about that the last time. So uh, as to, as to why that is. So Rob, if you want to go to the, the next slide, these are some questions. Yeah. That I want to, I want to just comment that this, Oh yeah, yeah, please. Sorry. I'm this, sorry. Um, this could be instead of colleague, instead of employees, uh, it could be your constituency and it could be your, your grant makers or your donors or your, um, uh, and then that yields financial performance. There are a lot of different ways of looking at this. And Fred Reicheld, uh, which I think we're gonna talk about later. We are gonna talk about uh, that. Wrote, you know, a couple books on this exact thing, which is around loyalty and satisfaction. Um, so, um, but, there, you know, there are a lot of different ways to plug your particular situation into this metric, and and it yields the same thing that uh, that you have you have better, you know, better fundraising, better don donor, uh, better grant making, uh, better financial performance if if you have these two things going on. So, which I'm going to the next slide. Great. Is it a build? And you slide? just build it. Yeah, just build build them all. I'm going to build it up, Ed. There you go. Perfect. Oh, no, I oh. screwed that up. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, now no, we're there. That's okay. No, you're good. Uh, uh, so the here, fir first question is that, again, this is focused now on the, your, your, your internal folks. How can we educate our people better than the competition? So the people that you compete against uh, yeah. in both technical and people skill areas. So whatever the technical area that your, your uh, organization operates around, that, I, I'm, not, I'm remaining silent on what that is. That's up to you. So that they will be more valuable than their, than their counterparts at other organizations. That's what we're looking to do um, in this particular case. So, um, and then the next question. Not trained, no, we're not training them, Matt, are we? We're no, we're not. We're educating them. <laughs> we hate the word training. We hate I training. Do. We love education. <laughs> we do love education. Well, which would you rather be, Rob? Would you rather be trained or educated? I think I, I'm going to opt for educated. That, don't you think? I mean, I, you know, a training sounds, sounds like somebody standing there with a whip going, you yeah. will be trained, you know? So. <laughs> it doesn't sound as good. <laughs> I'm going okay. to move on now. Yes, go, go ahead. Um, how can we become more valuable to our constituents by listening to them and applying uh, and understanding their situation better and applying yeah. those two things together? And then the last question, Robin, I want to get on to the, the next thing, as well, which is what are the three things that we, you would change about your company's policies and practices? Very sim simply, or it seems like a very simplistic question, but man, the uh, the, the conversations that I have had with organizations when people are really willing to be forthcoming about what they would change about their company's practices and policies have led to it, extraordinarily powerful results. So super hard to do. I don't yes. because, just because we can put this on a PowerPoint slide doesn't mean that that's easy. Three is hard and three, three from the top down is very hard, but very, very powerful if you can do it. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about, though, is uh, yep, go on. That is, and Rob, I know you've got some experience with this this one as well. Mm -hmm. Marcus Buckingham wrote a, a great book about mm, a dozen years ago called "Now Go Work on Your Strengths." Yeah, and in it, he shares this mm -hmm. survey that he suggests be used inside any organization on roughly a quarterly basis. 
Isn't so that, that called should... the Strength Finder, Ed? It is called the Strength Finder. That's yeah, correct. That's that, where you yeah. can Google that. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I think that's a, that's a later name for it. When it was in the book, they, I don't think they had a fancy, you know, marketing name for it yet. So I just call it Marcus Buckingham's 12 statements. The, what's interesting about this is the, way, the, the, the what he suggests too is a six point scale, not a 10 point scale, but a six point scale. And you have to have an even number because the scale is as follows. One is strongly disagree. The what, two is disagree. And three is uh, three is somewhat disagree. But four flips over to somewhat agree. So you can't mid-grade this. You can't say, well, you know, it's so average. So they, they, they suggest this six-point scale working all the way up to strongly agree. And they suggest that you put these statements before everyone in the organization on a quarterly basis and measure the response back. I mean, you can do this in, in any number of tools now. You know, Google survey, there's like just a MailChimp. There's so many different ways that you can go about or survey monkey, um, get, getting this information inside. And what they, they suggest that you do on this is then you find out the two or three that have the highest score and you make them better. So because the temptation is to get the scores back and go, oh, look, we got twos or threes around this particular thing. We should fix that. And Buckingham is like, no, that's why the book is called Now Go Work on Your Strengths, because it says the, the, what you want to first do is solidify the people who are in the organization today. And the way you do that is by making what you're doing, doing really well even better. Because if you make that even better, then you can begin to go back and fix stuff, which is harder to do, and people will be more forgiving of it as you're, you're beginning to make changes to the organization. This so is really first powerful. work on the strengths. Yeah, this is this is if you're not familiar with this, this is a very powerful concept because uh, for years um, testing and this kind of thing said if you were not good at math, uh, but you were good at verbal and writing, that you should really work on your math. Right, you should be well-rounded. You should be your math. This kind of just obliterates that whole notion and says, "Look, don't do math if you're terrible at it, or you know, if if it's just not a competency that you hold, or uh, you have a desire. Really, become amazing at your verbal and written uh, skills and focus on developing those. You will be happier, more successful. You know, g generate more value and all that stuff. And that, at the time when he created that, was." I don't know if it was revolutionary, but it was unusual. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it made it easier to say, you know what, that's not a thing I'm going to focus on. I'm going to focus over here where I'm already good. Yes. Um, and that's, that's the, that is the beautiful thing about this. Yeah. So, and I love these questions. I think they're, they're not questions, they're statements, right? And you're, yeah. you're, you're measuring the level of agreement with the question in that one to six scale. What I find most fascinating about this, and I, I will always remember this when I read the book, it jumped out at me that the, that the one of the 12 that is most highly correlated with financial performance of the organization is, drum roll please, I have a best, best friend, friend at work. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not surprising. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I, and I can remember talking about this with somebody who said, do I really have to make sure that like I have people, they have best friends at work? You know, only if you want to improve your financial performance. So, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's, it seems completely soft. Let's sing Kumbaya in a hot tub, you know, mm -hmm. crazy. It's a leading indicator for a lot of other things that go well. Yeah, exactly. Sure. That's exactly oh, right. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. So. Yeah. Um, and and just like to say, and it was it was it was great. I, Rob, you are one of my former best friends at work, so it's it's good it's good to be it's good to be able to work with you. <laughs> All right, so that's what we think that you should be doing with your from a from a team uh, measurement standpoint. Use that. Uh, the next thing up, and I, Rob, I know we got to be careful here because you and I could probably do a couple hours on the next slide. Um, we have. <laughs> yep, and that is you mentioned this earlier, but Fred Reichel's ultimate question. Yeah. is, and if any of you have taken a survey, you've seen this question, I promise you, it's out there absolutely everywhere. But Reichel has been writing books for on customer satisfaction and loyalty for four decades. I think his earliest book, The Loyalty Effect, goes back to the late 70s. And it, in that, ba that book, it, it's like a third of the book is the actual book, and then two thirds of it is the 
crazy math behind it that he where he figures all of this stuff out. He had kind of an epiphany 20 years later when he wrote the book, The Ultimate Question. He said, you know, all of that data, like all of that math that I did in the first book? Yeah, forget about that. Because we've really narrowed it down to just only one question that you need to ask your constituencies. And that is this, what is the likelihood that you would recommend us to a friend or colleague? End of story. Just ask that question. And this is a zero to 10 scale. And there's lots of implementation stuff behind this. As I said, Rob and I have done detailed presentations on this subject alone that can go, you know, an hour or 90 minutes, even longer. But honestly, still, uh, in my view, still the best, the best possible question that you can ask to your constituencies to find out how well you think they're doing. So, Rob, take a few minutes on this and let's, most, let's Dave, look. It is it. Read the book. It's anything by Fred Reichel is amazing. If you want to build. Um, a highly loyal client base or customer base or employee base. Um, the ultimate question is, you know, on a one to 10 scale or a zero to 10 scale, how likely are you to refer a friend? Is the most gamed, misused survey instrument in the world now, because if you've ever had your car serviced or if you've ever gone anywhere and you've had, a, you've had the technician or a rep say, hey, can you give me a 10? It would be amazing if you could give me a 10. It's because the organization for which they work uses some version of the net promoter score, which is what this is now based on. Net promoter is the name of the instrument. And, but, but his, his whole concept was highly loyal, highly satisfied employees and highly loyal and highly satisfied clients um, will spin up revenue growth uh, and success of the organization. And the, there are, and it is very powerful. However, it is easy to gain if you don't do it well. Um, whenever there is, you know, performance measures are tied to it or things like that, it always opens this up, unfortunately, to gaming, meaning they're going to, you know, they're going to somehow try to extract a 10 because it makes their marks go up. So um, a big fan of Fred Reichel on customer loyalty, on employee loyalty, and on on this on surveying and how how valuable it is. And then there's also the uh, the opposite side of that is that with you know it it creates opportunities for a lot of of misuse uh, because it's so powerful and so many organizations uh, use the Net Promoter Score today. Now, it's a terrific point, Robin. He he warns in the book about yeah. gaming and and explicitly says don't do it and don't use it. Uh, as a as a for for compensation, he says that if, no, if, once once idea. you begin to put put it in, and and being either a main driver or even an underpin for compensation, mm -hmm. it will become gamed. Um, and well, which is true by the way of, of any any metric. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in the in the remaining few minutes because the the last part of strategy is developing these things that are are measurables inside the organization, but. Delta did a Delta just back in the day when I used to fly somewhere. Um, <laughs> Delta has taken this one step further. They have a one, and I think a lot of others have added this now. They have a one question survey. Uh, when you when you get off the phone with one of their agents or whatever, it is you know on a one to five. How likely is it that you would hire the person that you spoke mm. to? If and and that is a point of impact kind of thing, and it gives them instant feedback on you know, how well they did, but it's, it's, they've gotten it down to a single uh, question. So mm -hmm. yeah, very fascinating stuff. Yeah, no, it is. And there's, there's lots of different ways that, that you can tweak this to be more meaningful in different different areas in, in inside the organization. Yeah. So, all right, cool. Um, let's move on to the next one. And this is now another tool. So similar to the ones that we've shown you, the SWOT, the star stuff, continue, the, the, uh, the, 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 the Xerox equation. Very simple, just a list for, for individuals to come up with of stuff that they've done in the last month. Very technical here. Like what stuff have you done in the last month? And then is it automated or not? And then if not, how will it be automated? Just to try to try to go go through, go through this process, we, I mean, this is something that we think a lot about at Sage, which is is the notion of artificial intelligence and 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 bots and all of this stuff, and you know, I I really do firmly believe this. I don't think that any of us is ever going to walk into our office and suddenly see a robot sitting in our chair going, "Oh crap, he took my job," right? That the, or the robot took the job. That that's not going to happen. Bot bots are going to continuously take 
get take over new tasks, but they're not going to take over jobs. And I think like that's the that's the narrative that we hear in in the in the media that oh we have to worry about all of these these technologies taking away jobs. I don't think that that's necessarily the case. They're going to take away tasks, which is good because quite frankly, I don't know if you've seen what a bot does, Rob. But if you if your job if your entire job can be taken away by a bot, your job pretty much sucks right now. Like it's a terrible job, right? It's really boring. If if everything that you could do, some 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 algorithm could just do more autom more, more more automatically. But we humans are incredibly creative at coming up with new ways to serve others. And as automation increases, what, what I found is the exact opposite. It's not the fear of, oh my gosh, the, the jobs are going away. It's, oh my gosh, what are the opportunities that we now have to put people it, it, it onto problems that we, we can need, need to solve that require more creative thinking than just the old bot style stuff. So the list of what can we automate as quickly as we possibly can, I think is a great place for a lot of people to start because it really does free up the capacity. As I said earlier, if you want to start doing stuff, you got to start stop doing other stuff. And automation is one of those places where we can really find a lot of things that can, that, that can be uh, transferred over. So so any thoughts on that, Rob? It's a blatant uh, uh, plug for our company. JMT is in the business of helping oh. uh, do that exact <laughs> thing every day. So if it's a question, call us. We'll be glad to uh, give you a hand. Yeah, yeah. And well, I, I didn't mean it as a blatant plug, but I'm glad you picked up on it. That's again, really myself. good stuff. Nice green okay. card paper again. And I really, uh, <laughs> that's great. All right. Well, we've got about 12 minutes left and I want to talk a little bit uh, um, now about a caution of, uh, on about measurement. Um, one, one of the early slides we talked about the, you know, how do you measure it as being one of those how based questions. And the real question is, that you want to ask is what is your level of commitment rather than measurement or what is actually the, what is the judgment that you need to make because if you think about it, all measurements are actually judgments in disguise. Judging what it is you're going to measure is the more important decision than the actual measurement itself. And this, this uh, measurement system has had some very tragic origins for this. I have, you, you might recognize this as a slide of you know, a chopper coming down in a field someplace in Southeast Asia, probably Vietnam. And the tragic story of Robert McNamara and, and, and his use of body count as the metric that they were using to run the war. The entire war was driven on the metric of this revile and gross thing called body count. And it was bad for obvious, a number of obvious reasons, but the biggest one was the fact that, well, yes, it's true that if you killed two Viet Cong, it was minus two Viet Cong. But the problem was is if you also killed eight non-combatants, you created like 80 more Viet Cong. <laughs> because then the families of the people that you took out were now not very happy with you to say the least, if I could be you know, real banal about it, right? But the, the, the point here was, is that the reason why they used it as the metric is because it was easy to roll up in a report. It, it, was, it was easy to, 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 to count all the stats and report it on up the, the, the chain of command so that we could say, oh, and this was the number. It went all the way even to, to, to the news media. This is what they focused on. McNamara, in his biography, to his credit, I suppose, uh, said that the, the implementation of body count was the, the worst moral decision he made in his entire career. And he, because he recognized the, the problems with it only after the fact. Now, fortunately, fortunately, I don't think that there's much that we're going to do to be as bad as putting something in place as a measurement like body count inside the R organizations. I don't think that that's going to happen. We do have to be careful, though, what we decide to measure. And Rob, if you go to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about this, this concept. And the late Clayton Christensen has this terrific quote about understanding future performance. He said, the only way to look at the future is to use a theory because conclusive data is only available about the past. So we, we do accounting, right? We're accounting for it. It happened yesterday. We're accounting. It's all, it's all in the rear view mirror, reverse look. 
what we really want to do is we really want to take have our strategy be based on a future directed theory. What is our theory? And Rob, quick go to the next slide too, because this kind of builds it out. And this is what scientists do. They construct the theory. They observe like we all do. They categorize things into different groups. And then they try to come up with the simplest possible explanation. This is called Occam's razor. This notion of what the, the simplest explanation is probably, not always, but is probably the actual real answer. And then what you do is you make a prediction about the future. You say, I predict that if this number goes up, then this number will go up. And then you either confirm or falsify that. So going back to what we re remembered with regard to the, the Xerox model, remember, if we're predicting the future, we have to look at things that uh, a little bit differently. And what I want to present to you now is what Einstein called a Gedanken experiment. If you go to the, the next slide, Rob, a Gedanken experiment, which is a thought experiment. If you're the CEO of, let's say, American Airlines, it doesn't really matter. What are the three things that you're going to look at if you want to predict whether the people on this plane will fly your airline again? Now, not that they have a return ticket, right? I get that. I get that, right? <laughs> that, that's they that's buy the idea. Did they, they buy, buy a ticket? ticket. Right. Yeah. Will they? Will they? Will they fly your airline again? What are the three things that you're going to look at? Really? Um, yep. Yep. And it turns out that they are as follows, right? Number one, the first one is on-time performance. The second one is lost luggage. And the third one is customer complaints. So if you, yeah, bring us right there. So this is what are known, is known as the triple crown in, in, uh, in, in airlines. Now, here's the interesting thing about that. These are the three metrics that they use to predict future financial performance of the organization. They don't look at revenue. They don't look at cost per flight. They don't look at any of this stuff. They, well, they, they look at those, but they don't look at it for, as their predictive indicator of the future. These are the ones that they use to, to predict if they're going to have a better next quarter. Are, is on-time performance going up? Is lost luggage going down? Are customer complaints going down? That's what they look at to be predictive about these things. Now, I think what's interesting about this, a couple of different things. Number one, who... Who can influence these? And it turns out a lot of people can influence all three of these. Certainly the baggage handlers can, certainly the pilots can, certainly the flight attendants can, certainly the people behind the, the, the customer facing ticket counter can. Certain the people even you know make, making uh, reservations on the phone if you if you have to call uh, the, all of the customer service representatives the CSRs because the customer complaints all of those have a handle on that. Turns out that there's one glaring department that has no influence over the future financial performance. Guess which department this is? Finance. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> finance does finance does can't really affect on time performance or lost luggage or customer complaints. Right, it's really, it's really weird that way. So bizarrely, those three do not impact this, but everyone else in the organization can. So when you're looking for your key metrics your key performance metrics. And Rob, if you go to the next, next slide, I want you yeah. to actually begin to think of them as key predictive indicators. So what is the future prediction of success? Not performance metrics, how did we perform? But let's predict something in the future that says, if this goes up over the course of the next three months, six months, one year, two years, this is where it's tied back into strategy. We believe that we will better be able to serve our communities and perform better from a financial perspective. So Rob, thoughts on that? We've got yes, about five minutes left, so. Back to my, you know, my, uh, uh, my former life as someone who traveled on an airplane occasionally. So <laughs> Delta, Delta is one of the most on-time airlines in the world today. They weren't. And so I think they understood this, but what they did to improve the metric is I, you know, I fly, I live in Jacksonville, Florida, Jacksonville Beach, Florida. I fly everywhere I go, I fly through Atlanta. Atlanta, the Atlanta flight's 42 minutes, you know, uh, 42 minutes from takeoff to touchdown. The, the actual flight time when they sell you a flight is 80 minutes. So what they did is they said, sure, we'll be on time 100% of the time because we're gonna double the amount of time that we allot for the, for the trip. And what has happened is, and honestly, the, the flying public doesn't care because all they care about is missing their connection, being able to predict when they're gonna be on time. 
So the fact that the actual airline flight time is half of the, the time that they sell, just as a device they used to improve this thing right here, which was the most important thing, right? And that is, are we on time? And so when you're thinking this through, they just, they just sat down at a str strategic planning meeting and said, how do we fix that? And the innovation they put in place is, let's double the amount of time we allot for flight. Worked for them. More importantly, Rob, yes, they, they doubled it, but they let you know what it was in advance. We, yeah. what, what they, what they, it's a right. psychological basis is we, we are, much, we are more, much more willing to wait if we know how long. Yeah, right. I mean, we it, instantly adopted it because yeah. all we cared about was missing our next flight or being able to predict Correct. when we got somewhere. Yep. And honestly, it's, it's amazing. It's uh, yeah. clever, very clever. Well, you are to Atlanta what what you know what we are in Texas to Dallas Fort Worth, yes, right? You can't get to right. heaven or hell unless no. you fly through Dallas Fort right. Worth first. That's right. <laughs> um, okay, and lastly, just want to 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 wrap this up and say this is why this measurement us is stuff is so hard. So after you have had the strategy conversation and develop yeah. those things that you're looking at, develop those metrics that you are, just recall this, that the value of a measurement is oftentimes inversely proportional to the ease of measuring it. And if it's something is easy to measure, it's unlikely to be impactful. And it's unlikely to actually be predictive. Yes, me measuring, measuring the number of dollars that come in is easy to measure, but is it predictive of future fundraising? And the answer is no. So the likelihood is, is that the more difficult something is to get a handle on around from, from a measurement standpoint, the more valuable it is. So don't under invest in, in the systems that allow you to capture those harder to measure things. So I'll, I'll leave it there, Rob. You can go to the last slide, which is just a close. So, or the- Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, once again, we've, you know, chewed up an entire hour of this, Ed. Yes. Uh, so, and that slide's not, what to do no, next apparently is nothing because it's not. Uh, just, just go, no, just go to the thank you. Just jump to the thank you slide. No. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ed. Yeah. Thank you, Ed and Rob for the presentation today. Uh, Ed, did you want to talk on this side? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. So, uh, no, you, you were going to just mention when the office hours and stuff are, is that That's right? That's correct, yeah. Um, so we have office hours coming up on um, March 23rd weeks. at 3 yep. p.m. Eastern. Um, so you're encouraged to join. We'll just continue the conversation. Feel free to ask any questions that you have. Um, also, at the end of this webinar, there's going to be a survey to fill out that'll be just um, on the browser after you exit. Um, and that's just going to be on what you would like to hear for our last session. Um, on it would be great April if you could 13th. give us pins. It would uh, be really so great. Stop, stop it, Rob. Tins. We need all <laughs> tens is what we're looking for. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, be sure to fill that out. We'd love to hear your feedback and be able to kind of base the next session off of what you would like to, we all want to get out of it. Um, but yeah, that, or Thank here. You. Oh, we have a thank you from Teresa. Um, <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them or join our office hours again on March 23rd. We'd love to see you there. Thanks, Ed. Thank you awesome. so much, Ed. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Lauren. Have a great day. <laughs>